OK, um, let's get things going. So first of all, thank you, everyone uh, who is able to join today's webinar on the discussions on mental health for vulnerable pop, uh, groups. Uh, I'm noticing a lot of familiar faces and some new ones as well. Uh, but I'd like to begin our second annual virtual event. Uh, so my name is Tulsi Modi, and I'm in the Social Media and Events Chair at the Coalition. Uh, CGHI is a nonprofit organization by early career professionals and for early career professionals in global health. Um, CGHI is represented by 30 active members from five different continents, um, and our mission is to empower our members and our global community to be action-oriented professionals that the world needs and to bring innovative solutions to the current global health issues. Um, so we do this through our community of events, such as this one, and through our unique pre-incubator style CGHI Action Tank um, program, which is where we facilitate professionals to develop their ideas into actionable projects, such as our current project in Kenya. Uh, so we would like to invite everyone here to join our community, uh, visit our website, follow us on social media. Um, but today, we're <laughs> really excited to bring you two incredible rock star speakers uh, to discuss mental health in vulnerable groups. Um, so first, we're going to hear from Lynn Hendricks about enabling environments with young women living with HIV to thrive. And then we'll hear from Mantu Dipane about how violence and mental health problems increase HIV susceptibility among female sex workers. Um, after we hear from the speakers, we'll go into breakout rooms. Uh, and then we'll reconvene and share a quick summary about what we've learned and follow up questions. So um, I think now would be a great time to tell you about our first speaker, Lynn Hendricks. So Lynn is a practicing research psychologist who lectures and conducts research in the Department of Global Health at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. She's an, ex an executive member of the Psychological Society of South Africa and she is currently a Global Minds PhD scholar and is completing a joint PhD in social science at the KU Levin in public health at Stellenbosch University. She's also the co-founder of Hearts in Action, a nonprofit focusing on gender-based violence and youth. And Lynn has been a keen, uh, has had keen interest in working with communities to design, conduct, analyze research, as well as to disseminate research findings. So, Whew, that is quite a bit of a background. Lynn, I'm going to turn it over to you to tell us about your discussion topic. Everyone for joining. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, is it okay for me to go ahead and do my presentation now? Absolutely. Feel free to okay. share your screen. What I do. Let me just share. Okay. And everyone can see the screen uh, clearly now? Yes, perfect. Awesome. Um, so just uh, thank you for that really lovely introduction. And thank you so much for having me. I know this group works really hard. The committed group of young people. So very impressive how you've managed to pull all of this together. Um, I'm glad that I got connected with you and got to know more about your work. So just thank you very much for the invitation and for this opportunity. Um, to give some context to what I'm going to be presenting today, um, I've just completed a four-year research study with young women in Cape Town who were born with perinatal infections of HIV, meaning they acquired it from their moms, either during birth or through breastfeeding or while they were in vitro. Um, so many kids who are born HIV positive are not really born HIV positive at birth. Some of them seroconvert, meaning they become HIV positive when they are five, six, seven, eight years old. Um, a lot of them might not know that they are HIV positive until they are 13, 14 or 15, or maybe even older, depending when their families disclose to them. So in this instance, they are going to the clinic regularly 
um, some of the moms that I worked with in the study didn't know that they were HIV positive when they were pregnant because they were negative before. Um, and then during the pregnancy, they became HIV positive. So not all the moms were HIV positive before being pregnant. Not all of them knew about their status beforehand. And a lot of the girls I've worked with, they have lost either one or both parents um, in, in their lives or, or siblings um, due to HIV. So how I'm going to frame this is I'm going to do a small um, background today on mental health for people living with HIV and then zero in specifically on young women living with perinatal infections because mental health is a serious issue for them. And then give you some overview very briefly about the study and how we did it. And then some key lessons to take forward and then prime us for some discussion after that. So if we think about mental health, and I found these two infographics that are great summaries. I don't believe in reinventing the wheel, but they are two good resources for you to access access on the SADAC website, so that's S-A-D-A-G. It's the only toll-free mental health helpline that is in South Africa at the moment. They release really awesome information um, and specific information in the various fields um, for people to access who are feeling depressed or anxious or suicidal. And what you can see from this infographic that there is a large proportion of people who suffer from mental health issues in South Africa. People who live in South Africa are already experiencing some extreme poverty, experience high amounts of violence. Women are experiencing large amounts of femicide. They constantly live in fear of their lives. Kids are being kidnapped, kids are going missing. I don't think I miss a day where I don't see something in the newspaper related to a violent crime that has occurred in the country. So even if it's not in your direct space, it's in the media that you're consuming all the time. And it does affect, affect how you think and feel and behave. And living in a very violent society, when we think about young women who find themselves in vulnerable communities, this is multiplied times a thousand because they're literally living on the doorstep where gangs are at war with one another. They don't have access to food. Um, the current project I'm working in looks at teenage pregnancy and multiple abortions for girls between the ages of 13 and 15. These are girls that are falling pregnant because they are in relationships with older men, because they need food, they need money, they need security. Um, so this is a large issue for us. And if you think about young people, and this is the space that they grow up in, this is their normal, this is their survival mode all the time. They're going to grow up into adults that have so much to unpack when they are older because it, it influences the personalities, it influences what they think of the world and how they engage with others. Now, when we take that larger context and we drop in a young woman who is now 15 years old, she's learning to discover her body, she's learning to think about relationships, her sexuality, she's thinking about the future, and she's also aware of the fact that she is HIV positive, which has a huge implication on the, her self-esteem, her self-confidence, the way she engages in romantic relationships, um, the potential that she thinks she has in types of relationships that she engages with. Um, you can already see that this mental health exposures and issues are amplified even further. Um, growing up with a chronic condition puts young people in a very different space to the one and a young person without a chronic condition would grow up in. You think about life, you think about death, you're faced with loss, you're faced with um, thinking about what other th people think about you all the time. You know, for a teenage girl, that is a big thing. Uh, what are people going to think? 
And when you take medication, and I will show you some pictures in a minute, um, the medication has certain side effects on your body that you can't control. You might get bubbles under your eyes. Um, you could have scarring, acne, hair loss, swelling in the face or in other body parts. It's a really um, overwhelming condition when you think about the side effects. And I know that the other presenter is going to talk about how HIV affects the immune system and how that puts the body at more risk for infectious disease. But that is also the case here um, and what the second infographic is trying to, to show us that the virus that causes AIDS affects the immune system. And when your immune system is impacted, it means that you are more susceptible to other infectious diseases. Your morbidity rates are higher. Um, and so let me just go to the next one quickly. When we think about the mental health specific to young people's perinatal infections. Um, when you think about them and this is now based on my years of working uh, in systematic reviews around HIV AIDS adherence and also working with young people in this area. They are faced with loneliness, depression and suicide. Those are the three main things that they experience. And a lot of the time, interventions are focused on them taking their medication. So take this tablet and you'll be healthy and you'll live. Take your ARVs, take antiretrovirals, everything will be fine. But that doesn't fix the internalized stigma that they experience in the world. It doesn't fix the broken relationships. It doesn't fix the dishonesty that is present in the authentic relationships. And by this, I mean, they've got a lot of friends or best friends, but those, their friends might not know about their status. It's this heavy secret that they carry with them all the time. Um, and so this is something we really wanted to explore um, what, when we looked at what the literature usually includes for young women with perinatal infections. A lot of the reasons that people don't take the medication are due to things like, oh, the medication has side effects on my skin, or it gives me crazy dreams. And that's a real thing. The medication does cause nightmares and tremors for some patients. Um, or it's it makes me sleepy. Or I, I don't have money to travel to the clinic. I don't have transport to get my meds. But what the literature did not focus on is the social impact of adherence. Think about yourself going to a party and it's a normal weekend and you're a teenage girl or a teenage boy and you have to carry your tablets with you, your ARVs. And because you live in a community where HIV is so well known and people know what the ARVs look like, you can't take it out. I can't take it out and people will see, oh, this is the blue tablet. Oh, you have HIV. All of a sudden, everyone at the party knows you have HIV. So instead, you don't take it. And then you become sick or it becomes a habit of not taking. Or you at school and it, you have to go to the clinic because you have to go and get your medication. And people notice that every third Thursday of the month, you're not in school. Oh, you have HIV. So then you'd rather stay in school and you don't go to the clinic. Stigma is a huge, huge, huge factor when it comes to adherence to medication. And it also is a huge factor in how young women think about themselves and their lives. Not taking the medication has extreme detrimental effects for young people living with perinatal infections. Because they've been on medication for so long um, growing up, they are more at risk for drug resistance, meaning as they get older, they have to keep increasing the dosages. Um, it also can mean that, you know, one course of treatment that might not work after a while and they have to give them another course of treatment, which might cause other side effects, weight gain or facial marks. Taking the medication does cause long-term mental health concerns. 
There's also clinical progression of the disease. So as you get older, you're in hospital a bit more. Your risk of dying is higher. Your risk of educational challenges is higher. I think out of my girls I worked with, one has a disability in her eye, the one has a hearing disability, but all of them dropped out at grade 10, grade 11 because they were missing school all the time. Work just became overwhelming for them. Risk of social exclusion. And then there's an increased risk of onward transmission of HIV to partners. So in this broader project, the main aim was to envision enabling environments um, for young women so that they can take the medication, but we did do it through a new materialist perspective. And this means that when we looked at the problem, we took into account everything in the environment. So the bed they sleep in, the house they live in, how do the walls look? Um, how does the community look? What do they see when they step out of their front door? What does the clinic look, see, smell? and feel like everything around them. We tried to have a bigger picture perspective and we had two specific objectives. The one was to understand adherence and the second was to explore how we study and do research with vulnerable populations. So these are our two communities in Cape Town. So let me just play this, you don't need the sound. Um, this is the first day I was driving through the community, and this is here in Wallace Dean Cryfontein, and my other community was here in Alsis River and Bishop Lavis, both in Cape Town, um, South Africa. Um, so the communities are made up of mixed residential living, there are some shacks, there are some brick houses, some people, but it's very clustered, and the clinic is on the main road. When you go there, people will see that you are going there because there is only one entrance in and out and the queues are very long. So when you go to stand in the clinic in the morning in your school uniform, you are very noticeable to other people. So when we think about envisioning enabling environments, and this is, I can't share everything with you because it's such a lot. Um, the first thing we did was we looked at what exists in the literature. So we proceeded to do several systematic reviews. These are some of the publications that we did. But what we found was that when we look specifically at this target group, it's not just one thing that affects their adherence and their mental health. It is everything. And it's not a linear, this affects B and B affects C and C affects E. All the letters of the alphabet are thrown into a bowl and mixed together, and that is what happens. Everything affects everything. Um, we used co-creation and participatory methods. So these are some of my participants. These are the other videographers. This is the GoPro when they tour in the clinic recording footage for us. Um, we had a movie premiere. This is my attempt at creating a storyboard. And just to show you how crazy it is, there was no storyboard with one clear phone, like going to the next frame, going to the next frame. When we wrote it, and I don't know if you can see these arrows here, they all link with one another. That is how complex the findings were of the study, which we tried to fit into this movie that we aptly named more than a pill, because it's not just the tablet. Um, this is just an example of us recording in the room. And the movie is on YouTube. You're more than welcome to watch it after this, um, to give it a look. It's about 40 minutes, and there is um, English translation on the movie. And then these are the storyboards that we use. So from those reviews, we created a storyboard and that's the story I'm going to tell you for my last few minutes, which will highlight the experience. We've given each of them the storyboard and what they did was they wrote notes on the sticky notes. So each person had their own board and they related their own experiences back onto the storyboard. So things they wanted to highlight, things they wanted other people to, to know. So everything in the documentary, stuff that they decided 
this is what I want people to know. And that's what I'm going to share with you now. Um, so this is the storyboard. Um, and from here, I'm going to take you through the experience of being a young woman living with HIV and a perinatal infection. So, and I'm going to tell it to you exactly how it's written in the review that we published, because we published it as a story. Should I tell her, no, I'll go to the clinic. The nurse will know what to say. Mom, why are we going to the clinic? No, I shouldn't tell her. I definitely need to take her to the clinic. So they go to the clinic and the daughters, I'm so unaware why I'm taking these tablets. Why are we coming here? It's so overcrowded. There's no privacy. Why do I have to miss school to be here? Everyone's seen me outside. So I'll sit here, they prick my finger. Mom, what are they doing? Don't worry, dear, the nurse will tell you. The nurse came back with a very large folder and she told me I have HIV. What does that mean? Am I going to die like my dad did? I'm not going to live anyway, I'm so stressed. I should just go out and drink with my friends. It's been a few days since I found out and I'm so sad, I'm so depressed, I'm so lonely. I won't be able to tell my friends, they're going to make fun of me. What about the future that I used to dream about? Why is this happening to me? I should just kill myself, I'm going to die anyway. My family is supportive, but they don't understand. Why do I have HIV and my sister doesn't have HIV? I'm in hospital all the time. My twin sister is in a grade ahead of me. She has a whole future and I don't. I don't want to give up on my dreams. I know everyone motivates me. I met this new partner. I can't tell them yet. He doesn't want me to use a condom. I guess if he gets it, it's his fault. I did tell him to use a condom. I think I'm pregnant. Is my baby HIV positive? I knew I should have used a condom, but in that moment, I didn't know what to do. I should go drink with my friends. I'm old enough to travel to the clinic by myself now, but it's so dangerous. I have to cross the train tracks and I have to walk really far. The other girl that walked there, she was raped. If they rape me, Will they get HIV? Am I the one that's doing something to them? In my community, people say that if you have sex with a virgin, that your HIV will go away. There's the church or the mosque. There's a community center I could go to, but then people would know that's where I'm going. I have so much decisions, stigma to, de to, to deal with. At boarding school, I hide my pills under my bed. I go into the toilets, they are so dirty, and that's where I take my tablets. But that's the only place I can go. My pills are so big, I can't swallow them. I don't have food or anything to drink, so I can't take my tablets. I'm not sure what to do. Condoms, birth control, clinic appointments, relationships. I feel so trapped and I can't talk to anybody. I'm so lonely. I'm afraid to talk. I want to talk. My body is talking through side effects. I'm not sure why I'm taking all these pills. So I'm just gonna give you a second to breathe because I know it's a lot to take in. <laughs> um, so what we did was we, we took all of that and we put it into the documentary. So it was definitely like co-created. We did it together. We spent a weekend away together with participants and we made this movie. After we made the movie, we had a movie premiere where we invited their families, policymakers, researchers to come view the movie. 
And to answer one question, and that's the question I'm going to give you today, is how do we enable or how do you enable in your own capacity the environment for young women? And there were different answers, including love, support, knowing what the bigger picture is, training doctors and mental health professionals better, um, working and raising awareness in communities around stigma, but then also participants giving encouragement to other young women and saying it's not the end. You know, things, it spirals like this is how they explain. It goes up and down, up and down. You feel bad, you feel okay. You feel bad, you feel okay. Um, but it's a journey that you can take with the correct support. In the end, um, the theory that I've proposed is that adherence looks something like this with a whole lot of factors influencing why you take your pills or why you don't. It's the social, it's the psychological, it's the biological, it's your environment, it's the health system, it's the political rules, it's accessibility to medication. It's accessibility to your own body, the right to make your own decisions. All of that affects how you engage with your health, mental and, and emotional well-being. So some of the key lessons um, from this is that living with HIV is complex and multi-layered. And our different understanding is that adherence has less to do with people's motivations and needs and wants to take it but it's everything to do with how their bodies, the virus, the things, ideas, institutions, environment, social processes, how they all assemble into this phenomena, phenomenal space, I guess, where adherence occurs. And our environment really affects how we think, feel, and behave. So we really need to work towards more transdisciplinary frameworks. And there's still a gap in research that includes the material in our understanding um, that we need to plug with future research and more studies. So I'm going to end by reading this quote um, that one of the participants wrote while we were doing uh, a collage. And she says, many times I thought it was the end of my world, but as time goes on, I think you learn to accept things that just weren't meant to be and move on to better things. And here I am at it again, creating a whole new world for myself. So just remember, sometimes things get the best of you, but it isn't the end. Uh, so thank you everybody. I hope I said something that resonated with you. Um, and something that, you know, prompts you or triggers you to think about um, others, I guess, and what you can do. And I've popped this question here for you to just keep in mind um, for the discussion about how you in your personal capacity can enable environments for young women. Uh, thank you very much. Lynn, thank you so much for that incredible presentation. I think we all need a minute to just digest that almost heartbreaking uh, story of what women are, are facing outside of just the typical medical side of it, of taking the pills. There's so many, as you mentioned, there's so many different factors and it's not linear, it's complicated, it's complex. Everything is interrelated. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions for Lynn. You can either begin posting that in the chat and we will come back to it after our next speaker, um, or you can hold on to it and, and we can um, again address it after after the next speaker. So um, Lynn, thank you so much, um, but yeah. let's move on. Thank you. <laughs> um, so our second speaker, her name is Mamtuti Bane. She is also very incredible. Um, she's a PhD candidate at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a recipient of the Commonwealth Scholarship. Uh, she uses mixed methods in her PhD to understand violence and mental health among vulnerable population and how these factors affect cortisol levels and the immune system. Uh, so before joining the LSHTM, Mantuti had worked at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, um, the Medical Research Council unit in Gambia, 
and uh, Manhika Health Research Center in Mozambique and the Taipei City Hospital in Taiwan. She's very worldly. Um, Mantiji has a background in global health, healthcare management, and biomedical sciences. Another incredible uh, speaker we have with us today. Um, Mantiji, if you can uh, go ahead and share your screen and I'll hand it over to you. Okay, hello everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, and night, wherever you are. I am Mam Pitupane, a proud Gambian, currently based in London and pursuing my PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I feel honored and excited to be here today to talk about topics that I love the most, mental health and violence. Um, many thanks to the organizers for initiating such an important and interesting event. As you can see in the title, I will be talking about violence and mental health and how they can increase HIV risks, especially among vulnerable populations, such as female sex workers. Okay. Um, here is an outline of our discussion today. I would appreciate it if it is more interactive. So don't hesitate to answer some of the questions that I will be posing. And if you have any questions or comments, you can kindly use the chat box. First, we will define key terminologies and talk about violence and mental health among female sex workers. I will then take you through the baseline findings of the Mysafiti study in Kenya in which my PhD is nested. Next on the list is a discussion on HIV in relation to violence and mental health. And lastly, I will talk about the stress response system. So first of all, I would like to ask, what do you understand by the term sex worker? Anyone out here, you can use the chat box or you can raise your hand and someone can just unmute your mic. What do you understand by the term sex worker? Who is a sex worker? Anyone out there? Okay. Charlie, go ahead. Yeah. Um... I think a sex worker is someone just like any worker. So it's a profession mm -hmm. and someone hopefully is uh, willingly uh, taking upon this job. Wow, that is a nice definition. Thank you. Anyone else? There's a couple of definitions in the in the chat as well. So okay. Jenna, I uh, haven't I, seen them. I can read them out. Um, oh, so Edena says, someone who sells sexual services. Rixi says, any person that sells sexual services. Uh, Simon uh, says, someone who exchanges sex for goods, services, or money. Okay, yeah. Perfect, excellent. Those are very good definitions, and you're all right. Um, according to the World Health Organization, um, yeah, um, or, or the UNAIDS, um, a sex worker refers to a person who regularly or occasionally receive money in, in exchange for sexual services. So this definition doesn't limit a sex worker to someone out there soliciting clients in bars or restaurants. You can be a sex worker 
under your own roof. So this makes it hard to determine the total population of female sex, sex, sex workers, for example, because some women might not term themselves as sex workers so long as they're not out there soliciting clients. But with this definition, if you sell sex or if you accept money for sex, then you are a sex worker. The next important term is violence. Based on the World Health Organization, again, um, violence is defined as the international or, I mean, the intentional use of physical force or power threats against oneself, another person, or against a group of people that either results in or has a likelihood or chance of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, or deprivation. There are different forms of violence, physical, sexual, emotional, even verbal and economical violence. How about mental health? The famous definition again, a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope with their normal, usual stresses of life, realize their abilities, learn and work well and contribute to their community. Poor mental health can lead to mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress dis disorder, we commonly call PTSD, which affect our thinking, behaviors, and interaction with others. Now let's have a look at what the literature says about violence, mental health, and HIV and AIDS amongst female sex workers. Okay. Globally, female sex workers face high intersecting challenges and health inequalities such as poverty, violence from various perpetrators, poor mental health, including substance misuse and HIV and AIDS. For example, in Kenya, similar to other parts of the world, female sex workers are at an increased risk of occupational and structural vulnerabilities, such as poverty, stigma, violence, and substance mis misuse, as I mentioned earlier. Research in Kenya has shown that about 90% of female sex workers experienced violence in the past 12 months, and HIV and AIDS is five times higher among female sex workers compared to the general population of women. Before going further, I would like to ask, why do you think female sex workers are at an increased risk of violence? Anyone, you can use the chat or raise your hand. Why are female sex workers vulnerable to violence? I don't want to make it hard. Just say anything <laughs> you think. The reason I want this to be interactive. Suti, I'm gonna read out some of the chat messages. Okay. So Charlie says, uh, power dynamics or social stigma. Exactly. Simon says, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Simon says criminalization of sex work. Mm -hmm. uh, Kale is saying they are vulnerable. They are a vulnerable population and vulnerable to power dynamics that Charlie mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. Ruxi says exposure to various types of individuals. Yeah, perfect. You all got it right. Thank you so much. Female sex workers' vulnerability to violence, as you all said, is largely linked to uh, um, their work environment, you know, stigmatization and criminalization of sex work alongside gender inequality and discrimination. You're all right. Thank you so much. So all these factors that I mentioned earlier, um, poverty, violence, and even substance mis misuse can increase the risk of mental health challenges. Um, despite the burden of mental health issues, challenges increasing globally, key vulnerable populations such as female sex workers often carry the larger share. For um, example, 
quantitative findings from the mice of ED study in which my PhD is nested showed that almost half of the female sex workers interviewed at baseline were depressed. A third had an, an anxiety and 14% um, had PTSD. In the upcoming slides, I will take you through the baseline findings on mental health from the Mysofiti study in Kenya. The Mysofiti study is a three year longitudinal mixed methods study of female sex workers in Nairobi, which is the capital city of Kenya, with the aim to examine the associations between violence against women, mental health concerns, harmful alcohol and drug use, biological changes to the immune system, as well as HIV and AIDS. This slide shows the findings of my first PhD manuscript, which has been submitted for publication. I hope it gets published soon. In this paper, I qualitatively investigated female sex workers' lifetime mental health experiences and perceived risks. A total of 40 women in the Mysofiti study were interviewed and 28 of them narrated their mental health experiences. From their narrations, the most reported risk of mental health was intimate partner violence followed by poverty, sex work related risks, and family bereavement. I am going to dive more into our findings around intimate partner violence and sex work related risks of poor mental health. As I mentioned earlier, intimate partner violence was the number one. Almost half of the women interviewed who narrated their mental health experiences linked it to intimate partner violence of all forms, physical, verbal, emotional, economical, and even sexual violence, which all occurred before they became sex workers, surprisingly. All the 11 women who reported IPV either asked for a divorce or escaped from their marriages or relationships to start a new life with their children. This led to several women entering sex work for survival as they were either orphans or raised by a single parent. They had not completed their education, had little or no support from their um, ex-partners and then couldn't find an alternative job for survival with their children. Their only option was joining the sex work industry. Also, findings showed that intimate partner violence accounted for the highest number of participants reporting suicidal thoughts about four out of the seven women, as this quote illustrates. Instead of giving you love, he gives you beating. So, this was a woman who narrated how her husband used to beat her. And then it follows. So when you reflect, you even have suicidal thoughts. Like I used to look at myself and wonder, I don't have a mother and I'm suffering with these children. I feel death was a better option. The other point is sex work related risks. Despite sex work being a good source of income for most respondents or women, it was noted as a risky job due to violence from police, clans, and even community members, as well as sexual risks and concern about HIV and AIDS association. This quote was from a respondent who recounted living, living with fear and being very stressed for her life due to her job, and it reads, me, I tell you, this sex job, sometimes it gives me stress. If I had been stabbed or hurt, I think about if I die because of this job, who will be left with my child? I just think about many things. Another paper that I wanna talk about just got published recently by the Massivita Research Team. In this paper, we looked at mental health and then correlates. 
like the factors associated with mental health. We found out that adverse childhood experiences, recent hunger, recent physical or sexual violence, as well as increased alcohol use, were all independently associated with anxiety, depression, and PTSD. So what we got from these findings is that experiences at childhood can affect you later on in life. If you experience negative event in your childhood, maybe being raped, that could increase your risk of ending up with a violent partner, which might also lead you into sex work, increasing your risk of mental health challenges and even HIV and AIDS. So it's vital to look into violence at a very early age. Now let's have a look at the pathways as to how violence and mental health can increase the susceptibility to HIV and AIDS, which is the main motive of this presentation. This diagram here is the conceptual framework of the Mysafiti study and which underpins my PhD. It shows the pathways of the factors which could increase HIV and AIDS risks among female sex workers. As you can see here, right here, violence, alcohol or substance misuse can lead to higher risk sexual behavior, which could increase the risks of HIV and AIDS here. Violence and alcohol use are also associated with mental health and they are bi-directionally linked. People with mental health are also, you know, prone to higher risk sexual behavior, condomless sex, etc., or increased sexual partners. These behavioral factors can directly increase HIV and AIDS or indirectly through biological changes, such as genital co infections and genital trauma, which could cause genital inflammation, a known risk factor of HIV and AIDS. So we can say violence and mental health can increase HIV risks through behavioral factors, high risk sexual behaviors. But there may be other pathways, which I will unpack in the next few minutes, right here, all these pathways. Historically, the link between violence and HIV was attributed to just sexual violence. But recent findings reveal that emotional violence, independent of sexual and physical violence, is associated with HIV. This suggests that HIV transmission during sexual violence does not entirely explain the association between HIV and violence at the population level. One could argue that emotional violence could, um, could result to higher risk sexual behaviors, which is right. But then further research have shown that emotional violence and physical violence, independent of sexual violence, are associated with CD4 activation in HIV negative women. CD4 is a lymphocyte, a white blood cell that regulates the immune response to antigen and then play a huge role in the suppression of immune reactions. So how does emotional violence get under the skin? How does it affect the body's system? How does it affect the immune system? There are physiological reasons and immunological reasons to suggest that one of those pathways could be the psychological stress response system or the mental health pathways, which when activated, results in the production of the hormone called cortisol. As you can see, when the HPA acts, that is how it is called medically, 
I don't want to use very big terms like hypothalamus pituitary adrenocortical acts. When it is activated, the hormone cortisol is released. In a normally functioning HPA acts activation, after the stress has occurred, cortisol stops and then re um, returns to basal level, but repeated or long-term stress can cause the HPA acts to overwork or fail to shut off after the event, causing abnormal cortisol level. Cortisol partly regulates the immune system and can weaken the immune system if levels are abnormal, as you can see in this picture. Cortisol also have a part in the cardiovascular system, in the nerve system, in the digestive system. So we now know how vital cortisol can be, right? So in my PhD, I aim to understand how cortisol relates to violence, mental health, and the immune system. This is vital because there's limited research and inconsistent findings on how cortisol is related to the exposure to violence and mental health, and whether this is gonna change over time based on negative events. Also, the inflammatory effect of cortisol has been reported, but has been scarcely studied among female sex workers. My PhD will therefore advance our understanding of the pathways of psychological, you know, stressfuls like viol uh, violence, which could map the link between, for example, violence and increased susceptibility to HIV. In conclusion, I believe everyone listening by now understands that female sex workers are vulnerable to violence and mental health in their lives. Poor mental health is both a driving factor into entry to sex work and the consequence of the sex work environment. There is therefore a need for both micro and macro interventions to address poverty and gender-based violence among vulnerable population in Kenya, thereby reducing mental health issues entry into sex work and risk of HIV and AIDS. Lastly, at an individual level, the take home message today is for us all to work towards having a bigger stress container in order to reduce our risk of mental health. Although we go through negative life events, stressed, for example, in our workplaces, education, and even relationships, we all need to inculcate the habits of helpful coping mechanism to release this tab right here in order to widen our, our stress container. For example, by exercising, taking some time off to rest, relax, go for sight, seeing and making friends. Thank you so much. I would like to thank the My Sofita Research Team, a vibrant team in Kenya, we also have collaborators in Canada and Toronto, and of course, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. All thanks to our participants and to my supervisors for their guidance always. And lastly, the Commonwealth for granting me a scholarship. These are some of the references that you might find useful. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Suti, thank you so much for uh, that very thought provoking presentation. I think if I were to say a few words about it, it's that everything is interrelated. Um, everything from, like you said, the social determinants um, leading into sex work. Also, what happens uh, mentally can impact. Uh, your physical health as well. And it's not just the HIV clinical outcome, but how how all of those moving factors are interrelated. Um, and and that get, that's a lot of thought provoking <laughs> uh, topics for us to discuss. Um, so uh, 
thank you again, Diti, for that. I know uh, we originally said we would do breakout rooms, but we have a smaller group with us here today. So I think we can stay in this one main room um, and open it up for questions. Uh, so feel free to either uh, unmute yourself or and, and ask your question to either speakers. Um, or you can pose it in the chat and uh, we can go from there. So uh, actually, uh, Lynn um, did suggest a question for discussion, uh, which is how can you enable environments for young women living with HIV to thrive? Um, so that's a great question. I don't wanna pick on anyone, so I'll, I'll leave it available for, for people to unmute themselves and uh, take a shot at answering that. I might jump in if you can hear me okay, depending on the internet connection. Great. We can hear you. Perfect. This is Kale. Um, I am I'm in CHHI, but <laughs> um, on, in a question, I guess, you know, it's, it's quite illuminating to see all of how many of those factors are at play. And it's so easy to not know um, what factors are present and causing an effect if you aren't aware of them at all. So I think part of um, enabling would be for everyone who's working in the field to, I guess, not only have a, an awareness of the array of factors that can have such a, um, a great impact, but also to um, it's things that you will never know that are having um, an effect. So to, you know, in, in, have an awareness of the unknown, but also an awareness of just how much stress all these different things place on an individual person and the very real effect that can have on something like you know, medical management of HIV or something. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Kale. Um, yeah, I think you, you summarized that well, but there's so much more than that top layer uh, that we don't think about. Um, Lynn, I'm going to try to answer your question and then maybe others can add on to it. But uh, one of the things that stood out to me from your your presentation was the fact that these um, antiviral pills are are specific color. And so the moment somebody sees that sees it, they know exactly, hey, this person has HIV. And I think one thing we could do, which you know has its pros and cons is, um, not make it so obvious that this is that what this is that type of medication, you know, by making it look similar to more common medications like, you know, um, uh, just Advil to ibuprofen, painkillers, or allergy medicine, um, which has its has its own concerns if we do that. But that's just one thought. Anybody else have suggestions? Um, Irene, I think I, you raised your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna, I think that's a, um, a short term solution, which is something that is needed because people are suffering right now. But uh, I would say, I'm not sure how to to, um, uh, to deal with the stigma, but uh, I'm sure that, that um, some kind of uh, more uh, understanding in the community about uh, HIV and um, perinatal HIV would would be needed. Not revolutionizing anything here, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I mean, when it comes to public health and global health, innovation is good, but oftentimes it's just the basics that we have to be better at as well. That's a good point. Uh, Charlie, I see your hand is raised. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you to both speakers for your wonderful and very insightful presentations. I really learned a lot. And I think um, Lynn asked a very important question. How do, how, what is in our power to create a better environment for young women living with HIV to thrive? And I think I am hopefully speaking on behalf of the coalition. Uh, we want to bring more spotlight to uh, researchers like 
the ones we have today. And we want to bring more spotlights to Global South, to lower income communities. And I think it's extremely important nowadays. Um, so yeah, so, and um, I would like to give back the mic. I, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Uh, it's another great point as well. Uh, Suji, do you have any uh, questions that you want to pose to to the group here? Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, I would want to say that I enjoyed Lynn's presentation, and I could relate to most of the things she mentioned. Uh, one of them was the use of pills, um, A, R, V, you know. Um, from our findings, um, um, we had some HIV positive female sex workers who did also complain about the pills being too big and which makes them very stressed, just the thinking of taking pills for the rest of their lives. So I could relate to what you uh, um, to that. Um, secondly, in, in, in terms of stigma, I think a good approach, although um, there is no one way of um, ending, you know, stigma, you know, there might be other, other, other ways, right? But I think, um, Sensitization can go a long way. People need to be sensitized about HIV and then normalize it. You know, it's like any other illness, disease. Okay. I have worked in, in an organization, I don't want to call the name confidentiality, um, in um southern part of Africa. In that organization, the hospital is just right opposite the research center. So when I first went there, I saw that women who came or men who came for ARV were right there open. You could easily know that this person is coming for ARV medication and it was normalized, you know. In that community, almost 30 something percent of people um, were HIV and AIDS positive and the research center did an excellent job by sensitizing people and it was just okay. So I, I think sensitization has a huge role that people know that HIV is like any other disease that also um, comes, um, I mean, leads into mental health as well, you know. It is not normalized in many settings, especially in where I come from, I would say, Gambia. You know, people link mental health to, to uh, 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 spiritual, you know, uh, um, all, all those things, you know, you know. So sensitizing them, let them know what mental health is. What are the signs and symptoms of mental health? I think it's important that will increase uh, um, health care, you know, seeking because some people might be mentally affected, but because of stigma, they wouldn't go to the, to the, to the hospital. And then uh, um, Lynn rightly said, okay, some might not adhere to, a, um, to ARVs because they don't want to be seen by their neighbors, et cetera. That was what I had in mind to say thank you so much <laughs> yeah that's a fantastic point you know we're in these scenarios it's not just the HIV sensitivity but also mental health and the two combined can get very very challenging um today I want to call on uh, a couple of people here but I do want to come back to uh learn more about what that one hospital did to really improve through the stigma in that community. But let me first uh, uh, pick on Yelena and then from there we'll go to Ruth. Yes, thank you. First of all, I want to thank both of you for amazing presentations. Um, they were really insightful. 
Uh, but I really wanted to comment on some of the things that uh, people mentioned here. Um, and that is that we really need to, I, I think, uh, talk more about mental health and HIV in women in general. Um, because despite these um, researches that you had going, uh, I would say that this problem really can be applied to any part of the world. Um, and even where I live, um, maybe a few months ago, there was, well, at least a really bad gossip about um, women catching um, HIV and AIDS and just, um, you know, in a very small rural, rural area. Uh, and I remember that um, I even read that uh, people started calling them by, you know, exposing their names, which I think really can impact their, um, not just mental, but just overall health. Um, and I think this was really um, just so meaningful to hear about the possible um, ways how you can uh, change this and maybe make um, a better change. Uh, first in small communities and then on a global level. Um, so really, I wanted to thank you. And it was amazing just to hear about all the different ways that we could, um, you know, make a change. Um, it can be small, um, but um, it will definitely not be overlooked. Thank you, Yona. Um, let's see, I'm going to jump over to you. And thanks uh, to the speakers for the great, great presentations. I think we all profited <laughs> to learn a bit more about this uh, very, very interesting topics. And um, yeah, maybe to give an opinion, maybe uh, how we can enable the environments. Maybe it's also a shift of responsibility towards a more centralized healthcare system, right? Because it doesn't have to be that the women have to go in one place where it's clear that it's an HIV center. It can be something that's more integrated and it starts from the education of the future healthcare uh, professionals, right? And then they can just go, I don't know, to their normal uh, consults and get their pills without having the stigma. So I think maybe it's also a redesign of um, needed that uh, will cause less stigma and maybe enable the people to live without shame. Yeah, redesigning healthcare delivery systems is in the need of a major makeover um, globally. That's a great point. Um, Trinity wanted to share about her project with women living with HIV in Kenya. So Trinity, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm pulling over the car right now so I can be more focused. I just landed from a, a flight. So thank you all for being here. Let me see. And thank you so much to both the presenters, like all the information I feel like it's very applicable to like everything that I'm passionate about and like working on and just within different communities. Here I will like show my face. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So yes, so um about a year ago um I moved over to Munsungano Island, Kenya, which is right on Ooh, Lake Victoria. Wow. And um you get to it by connecting through Rozinga and you take about like a 45 minute boat ride to the island and um so this island that i went on there's like a very high rate of hiv um and it originally started with it being among the men in the community and what this like led to happen is that many women became widowed in life due to not their husbands like not having access to specific um medical care care, mental health counseling, the pills that we were referring to. So there's a population of widowed women there, like about, I would say about 30 women that have lost their husbands to HIV. So on Fungano Island, the main way that the families make their income is um, the men go out to fish and the women are the ones that collect the fish and go to the markets. So what has happened is these women in this community, they, they don't have men or their husbands to go fish. So what has led them to go to the Lake Victoria at nighttime and ask these fishermen from different villages if they can sell these fish. And then in exchange, these men have asked for sexual flavors. So this has like 
expedited the spread of HIV now among these women, these wooded women in this community due to um, them having to sexually exploit themselves to support their families. So um, a family that I became really close with when I was living there, we had this idea of creating this project and basically this like grassroots organization together where we started um, fundraising to build boats to allocate to these women to choose um, men in the community that they trust to build this relationship with. So we began creating like many um, women's microfinance groups. And uh, so that's like the first endeavor just to have these women be able to have the empowerment within themselves to not have to rely on um, this ex sexual exchange anymore. So that's where it is right now. And then we've um, birthed it to be Again, uh, regenerative permaculture training, sending women and community members over to Uganda. But it really started with addressing uh, this um, population of women there, and now it just spread to the whole community. So, and it's been a a year, a year honestly, this month since we began this um, endeavor. So I'm just so honored to be here and to just be in like the presence of yeah, two beautiful like women that have um yeah, just really honed in on the power and just yeah, the resources. So thank you so much. That is an incredible project. I really like that it's women-centric, it's motivating, it's innovative, um, you know, community-centric as well. That's incredible. Um, I know Titi's in London normally, but I don't know if you're familiar with that area that Trinity was mentioning, but perhaps there's, there's overlap, which would be great. Great. Any, uh, Charlie, I see you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, Trinity joined our CGHI Action Tank program. So we are helping her to build and develop her project more. And Kale is the lead together with uh, Giovanna who cannot be here today. So if you'd like to get in touch with them, please feel free to do so. And if you wanna um, know more about our Action Tank, uh, please write to us. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions for from anybody else about to either of our speakers or to the coalition or even to Trinity? Trinity, I'm not sure if you're seeing the chat message, but you've got a lot of a lot of people applauding your initiative here. Oh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, it's yeah, such a collective work. Um, like it, literally in the space where anyone feels so inspired to go to Kenya, travel with me, like get involved, resource. Like it's really um from the ground level and grassroots. And yeah, this is all like yeah, the endeavor of a community. And it really takes a village to yeah bring this healing. So yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, Lynn has shared her email in the in the chat group in the chat box. So if anybody is interested in either connecting with her directly or following her her on Twitter, uh, she's messaged there. Uh, uh, Today, same for you. If you're if you want to share a way for people to connect with you, if they have follow up questions or a uh, link to your social media um, accounts or anything like that, that, this would be a great way to do that. Um, we've had some very inspiring and incredible women as speakers um, talk about their projects. So I know, uh, I know I'm, I've am i got a lot of food for thought to, to dwell on over the next couple of days, uh, but the, I wanna start wrapping things up. Um, so first of all, Thank you again to both of our speakers and the coalition team for working with me over the past uh, few weeks and months to make this event possible. Um, thank you everyone who took time out of their busy, busy schedules on this. Well, it's Thursday for me, but I don't know if anybody's joining where it's Friday already, um, but thank you so much for, for joining today's call. Um, we will be, we hold uh, these virtual events every year. Hopefully we can increase the frequency sooner rather than later. So if you know somebody else who would make a great speaker, um, please send them our way. Uh, I believe Charlie has posted information about our organization on the web, uh, including our website, our LinkedIn, 
Instagram and Facebook. So if you're not already part of the coalition, uh, please join. Um, do follow us on these social media accounts. Um, and with that, I think, and Charlie, yeah, Charlie, thank you for posting the email address as well. Perfect. Um, if there are any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, I will put